to talk about van life today and how this is all a lie. <laughs> Nobody's doing this. Nobody is living like this. There are plenty of people living in their cars and their van and doing van life even, but nobody's living like that. I want to talk about, I want to talk about some of the realities of living in a vehicle right out of the gate, just so you know. First of all, I come from middle class. I have white privilege. I'm able-bodied. I have a college degree. I didn't have any chronic illnesses at that time. I have, you know, a ton of privileges, okay? And van life was very hard for me. And I didn't live in a van though. I lived in a truck. So I lived in this truck for many years. And before that, I lived in a Pathfinder that was like super old and barely working. Don't I have pictures of the Pathfinder? I don't know why. I don't know why I never thought to take pictures of it. We also didn't have like smartphones and stuff back then. <laughs> so I lived in this truck. Uh, don't judge the Crocs. They're comfortable. Um, my friend helped build this bed. And then I kept all my, my cooler, my gear all on this left side. This is a very tiny, tiny bed. And I purposely made it so that no man could come in and sleep in this. <laughs> I didn't realize I was living the decenter men life like purposely until years later. I was like, wow, I literally created a scenario so that man, no man could ever stay in my home. I'm so proud of myself. That was so smart. Anyway, um, this was a very hard lifestyle. And again, I could have taken another path because I have a college degree, um, but I really wanted to work in outdoor education and stuff. And in that world, you don't get paid anything. As a raft guide, you don't get paid much. As an uh, outdoor educator, um, as, a, as a mountain guide, uh, I worked for Outward Bound. I worked for a bunch of different companies and they do not pay well enough, A, for you to even afford housing, but B, you're like never home and you're always on the road or sleeping in a tent or sleeping in your truck somewhere, like out of necessity. So like it's everyone who worked in this world ended up living in their car. And then a lot of climbers lived this life too. You know, like, I mean, if you've seen Free Solo, like that is so many climbers like literally move into their vans and just climb. Don't ever date those men, <laughs> by the way. I I'm glad that I didn't date anyone and no one dated me. I was definitely not dating um, material at this time. And that was a blessing because I've done a lot of cool stuff in my life because uh, I was living the decenter men celibate lifestyle. But the problem with this is I moved back into my truck. I lived in New York for a while and then I moved back in my truck for a while. Like I kept going back and forth because New York is also very hard. <laughs> and your apartments aren't much bigger than this. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to get into why this is like very difficult, like regardless of if you're in a, a tiny little oven and, you know, roasting like a hot chicken in the sun or you are in a, a larger container like a van. This is not this is this is not what Instagram has been telling people. In fact, I have been trying to pitch this article since 2017. When I first started seeing all these Instagram accounts with like photos, I'm like, what? No one's living like this. Why are they selling this? These people are lying. And anyone who does live in these nice vans, you will, you will never convince me that they are not like on the Nepo baby spectrum. Because like you have to be rich to live like that clean in a van. Look at this. I tried pitching this. Don't believe Instagram. Van life is not the liberating adventure it claims it is. Or I was, I was pitching several ideas. This is before I actually knew how to pitch. Now I know how to pitch. So I know why this didn't sell. Don't ever write a, t um, a subject line like that. By the way, I, I might get back into coaching again soon in terms of pitching and writing. So I don't know. We'll see. Stay tuned. This is actually one that I said. <laughs> How people living the sweet, sweet van life can avoid hating themselves while baking in their van like a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> again, terrible. I would not write this title again. Uh, but it's not so bad. But I, st I was like kind of upset that no one would take these pitches. And I was, I've been pitching about this for, even back in 2022, I was pitching this. Like, please stop promoting this van life. It is a lot. Nobody is doing this. First of all, this is a very expensive van. This is an enormous investment. Um, but that view, you are not gonna get that view. I'm gonna tell you why in a minute, but you, you almost will never get this view. Uh, may, unless you have a lot of money, Unless you have money, you will not live like this. And I mean, I really love, I love, I love what women do to spaces. This is so warm and inviting. I mean, look at that. I, I really do love how vans and tiny homes and stuff, people have gotten so creative. And, but I promise you, if you are living in a van, like, unless you are type A, or if you are ADHD, it will never look like this. <laughs> Ever. Never. And in this account, this person also has a dog. Definitely never gonna look like this. I am sorry, 
But living in your, I, I, you know, some of my friends had dogs while we were all living in our vans, um, working, basically living like nomads, following the work, right? That's what you have to do. You follow the work. We're going back, you know, going back and forth in California, New Mexico, Wyoming, following the work, the seasonal work, which again, I mean, the fact that we were keeping people alive on the river and had to have all these, uh, like swift water rescue, um, wilderness first responder, all these certifications that are very expensive. Like, I can't believe I even did these jobs and didn't have um, a trust fund. Because apparently I found out later on that a lot of the reasons why some of my friends were easily doing this because their parents were paying for it all. I was like, oh, that's how you are living in your van part of the year. And then in the winter time, you go to Thailand for three months. I could never figure out how they were doing that. And then I was like, oh, their parents are helping them out. It never occurred to me. Me or like my friend Liz, like so, like some of my friends were paying off student loans while living in their vans. And we were all like, how are all these people like having vans like this? And 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 then flying during the winter time to be their parents. Like like I was saying, I did the Nepo baby thing yesterday. Like ev nepotism is in like ev everything. Everything, and generational wealth, which is all built on like racism, white supremacy culture and patriarchy and whatever. Anyway, y'all know I don't got to focus. Melanie. The point is, is that I never understood why I was doing like van life so bad. It's because I didn't have, um, my parents weren't paying my bills and I didn't have uh, savings. I was living paycheck to paycheck. And so if you are, don't have a lot of money, do not move into your van. I mean, I know there's a housing crisis, but this stuff, I'm going to get into why it is so vulnerable, especially for women. Um, it is an adventure. It is liberating and all these things. But if you do this, the same reason, like, I'm not going to tell you don't move to another country. I moved to another country, but don't move to another country for a man. And if you do make sure that you are set up, like, I'm never going to tell you don't do the things I've done. I just wish that people knew the realities of it before they signed up for it sometimes, because it's actually really dangerous for people to try to do this, um, without knowing what you're getting into, because some people will give up you know, really important things to them that they worked really hard for to do this. And then they're like, this is a nightmare. I hate it. And I just threw away my life. Other people are like, this is the best thing I've ever had. Right? So to each your own, don't, I never want to discourage people from having, um, getting outside their comfort zone, having adventures, challenging themselves. I'm all about that. However, do not believe Instagram. I seriously can't believe that this woman has a dog in this. The, the, I, I can't imagine. Do you know how hard it is to live in a city? Like we have a dog in the city and we have like, we, we got a larger apartment um, so that we could have a, do a dog. And you know, we have like a little outdoor space. I, I can't imagine having a dog this big in this. Yeah, I also understand for safety reasons, maybe, but it <sighs> like this. <laughs> okay, the other thing I would also not suggest living in a van with a man. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't do it. I literally cannot think of a worse idea. You want to learn how to break up with someone right away? Move into a van with him. He thinks going to clean that van. Like unless, unless he's like a, a neat freak. You like, oh my God, there's so many reasons to not move in with a van. Um, Gabby Petito. Remember her? That was an abusive relationship, clearly. But I believe it escalated to what it did because of living in a, something like this. Van life is extremely hard. It's extremely hard alone. You put a psycho in a van, being trapped in a van with a psycho. I'm not saying this man is, I don't know these people. You put a man, the most dangerous person in a woman's life is a man. You put a, 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 the most dangerous thing, your own, our only natural predator inside a confined space like this. Anything that's already happening is, I mean, we saw like confinement, you know, COVID, like people were, were like going crazy being trapped in apartments and even giant houses with a man. That's why they're all getting divorced. Imagine living in something this small with a man. Please do not let a man convince you to move into his van with him. Unless you guys have a super solid relationship and know each other very well and have lived together already or like whatever, don't do this. Unless you want like a test to see if you guys are compatible, then do this. You'll find out real quick if you are, hate this person <laughs> or love them. But it's also super dangerous because y'all know that I've done lots of videos about how dangerous men are in cars and how they put our lives in danger in cars. In the home and in a car, all combined in one. Terrible. Don't do it. This is BS. 
This is nobody. This is nobody. <laughs> One of the things that I talked about in my pitch, several pitches that I sent out, is about cleanliness. And, um, okay, baby wipes are your best friend. You can be taking bird baths and baby wipe baths a lot. Um, you know, you can clean important parts with baby wipes. But if you're with the, we know that these, these dudes don't even wash when they have access to showers. We know they won't touch their butt. We know that they, um, you know, there's stains all over their underwear because they are so homophobic, they won't even wipe their own butt. Either homophobic or lazy, or both. So you really think this man is clean? Cisat men are the dirtiest people I've ever come across in my life. I promise you there's Thamunda cheese all in that. So this is nasty. <laughs> you don't want to be with the nasty, nasty man. And if they're nasty and, and when they have access to cleaning themselves, I promise you this is going to give you a disease. You can use all the baby wipes you want, but if this Thamunda thing is going anywhere near you, UTI, yeast infections, all of it. I also find this really funny. No one's doing this. Who is doing this? And by the way, this right here, this right here, I don't even know how much this costs, but I know a Sprinter van, like those Sprinter vans that are like the new whatever, those are like a hundred grand. And those are so popular because you can actually stand up in them. Because by the way, you're never standing up in your home. I don't know if people think about that, but like I couldn't even sit up in my home. And when I got up in my bed, I hit my head on the thing. So I had to sit like this, right? The only way I could sit was in the front seat of my truck. And it's a little claustrophobic. So a Sprinter van, people love those because you can actually stand in them. 100 grand, easy. I don't know how much this thing is, but I mean, this is, I would guess this is like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why not just buy a real house? I mean, I love the idea of this and I'm not saying don't do this. I'm just saying this is very expensive and only rich people are doing this. This is, this is why I'm talking about this. A lot of people live in their vans because they have no choice. A lot of people live in tents and are literally unhoused because they have no choice, because of the housing crisis, because of uh, mental illnesses, because of oh, a systemic racism, because it's, it's like so many women are homeless because of um, domestic violence. It's literally, one, I think the leading cause of homelessness for women is domestic violence. So um, the whole van life thing is, it's so annoying because they're like trying to capitalize on this housing crisis and they're selling it as like, oh, you can be a digital nomad and live in your van. Van life's hard. I don't even think digital, like digital nomad life is super hard. Ask any digital nomad. I'm gonna get into why later, but I just want people to know that, oh, first of all, this is like not, never gonna happen. If you want, nobody's doing this. But even if you want just like a simple van life, it is very, very expensive. And just, you need to know that going into it so that you don't sacrifice a bunch of stuff and then get stuck in this lifestyle. Again, I also wanna say, I loved my that time of adventure. I have no regrets about that time. I'm really proud of myself for all the things that I did, all the jobs I did, all the skills I learned. Um, it was very freeing, it was very liberating. But a lot of my reasons behind that were like trauma. <laughs> Running <laughs> from something, I literally lived on something with wheels. I'd get out of town real quick. That's another video actually, I wanna talk about that more. But um, I'm really proud of, I loved that f like, f you know, dust in the wind lifestyle, but a lot of it was really rooted in individualism and um, just like a lone wolf mentality. And even though I, I had so many amazing friends and, and jobs and experiences, at the end of the day, like I think if, if people can afford it and they want to, that kind of life is, is cool for a bit, but it is not sustainable in the long run and is unbelievably lonely and it is, it just reinforces that individual's mindset because it's very hard to find community when everyone lives on wheels and is, is taken off and doing their own thing all the time. It's very hard to find community. And if there's anything I've learned in all of my 46 years here is that at the end of the day, community building is the, is the foundation of things. It's the only way out of this hellhole. It is the only way to, I believe, for women to survive patriarchy. Um, and it's, it's it, it, I, I'm, I like to challenge myself. I like to be somewhat self-reliant, but I also do not ever want to be self-reliant. And in this um, lone wolf, I don't need anyone. I can take care of myself mindset because you can't. People need people. I'm sorry, we do. And I, as much as I loved the, that time in my life, you could not pay me to go back and do that again. 
because it was really lonely. Back then I wanted to be alone. I don't want to be alone now. And all it takes is one illness or one disability to really make you realize that we are really can't do this by ourselves. We weren't meant to. So go have your adventure if you want to do this. Have fun. Do it. Do if you need to feel confident and travel alone. I want people, I love women traveling alone. I really do. It's such an empowering experience, especially traveling alone versus traveling with a man. You travel with your girlfriends or whatever. But just please don't buy into this this whole thing because it is it is, it's, it's very expensive, it's very hard, and for a long period of time, it's, it's not sustainable. Do not give up your whole life to go live in a van because you'll get sick of it after like a year or six months even, and then you're like, oh my God, what do I do now? I mean, you'll figure it out, but still. I also think it's funny because this is, of course, how men <laughs> are. <laughs> I'm gonna live in a van, it's gonna be a big, big boy van. Like, look at this, this is such, you know, I understand why you want big tires, especially if you live in snow and all that stuff. Like, I get it. But, like, this just screams insecurity to me. This screams toxic masculinity to me. And don't live in a van with a man who does this. Also, this van, I don't know how much it cost. But, like, it, whatever you think it costs, and multiply it probably times 10. This kind of stuff is so expensive. I mean, look at this. <laughs> Tell me you're a man without telling me you're a man. Sorry, tell me you're an insecure man without telling me you're an insecure man. Look at all this crap. So this is all so unnecessary. Like this thing would be cool if it wasn't just like, I'm a bro, I don't want to be in the army, but uh. This gives like little more than anything. So this is me inside my truck. <laughs> so when I, this was, what was this like 2000, 12 maybe so i've been living in new york and i went back into living in my truck for months and this is before technology was better i had this little key thing that i stuck in the side so i could get internet access so everything has changed i'm sure it's a lot easier now but when i was living in my truck that's my sleeping bag i have my pillow all my gear like it see like there's not much space it's very claustrophobic getting power was really hard keeping my phone charged finding a place i could i had, couldn't p plug my computer or anything i know that they've resolved all that now there's solutions now but those solutions are also sometimes expensive i also want to show a, a, a time when we were all living in our trucks working and having to just follow the work um it's different now because you can get cell phone service in a lot of places and people are on their phones but this was before people had smartphones and I actually kind of miss this, um, so I, I don't think this is a problem now, but you actually can't get cell services in a lot of parts of the U.S., especially very, you know, uh, with the more like mountainous sometimes. This is one of my friends. He made a banjo from a tin cookie <laughs> container. He literally made this. He made this banjo. <laughs> See, that's like a, a Christmas cookie tin container. And then he added all this. It took him a while. He's very proud of this. We were all very proud of him for this. And so I love the creativity that comes in this environment. I kind of, you know, it's probably different now again because you can just get on your phone and spend all day on TikTok or Facebook or whatever. Back then we just had endless time. And when you don't have an internet connection, you are, have to entertain yourself. There's no TV, there's no noise, there's no people to talk to a lot of time. So you end up being very creative, but you're also really bored. You're really bored. Now, some people are going to be like really grossed out by this, um, but this is more like the climber van life thing. Like a lot of people have so little space in their trucks. I'm sure vans are different. Like some of these people are like literally living like very posh van life style. But, you know, Frisbees became plates. Frisbees are plates. We would dumpster dive a lot. I'm not sure I would necessarily do that now, but this was a whole box. They had all this free food outside of like Safeway or something. Um, yeah, I can't believe I ate this, but like that's a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> but you know, when you live um, like this, a lot of people like, really, you know, depending on how much money you make, I know some people are making a ton of money because they're working remotely, which wasn't really a thing when we were doing this, but we were literally dumpster diving at Trader Joe's, dumpster diving at Safeway and like ate garbage. Yeah, we ate garbage. Now, in our defense, a lot of times they're throwing out stuff that is not bad. They're literally like, it's this such a wasteful country. The United States is so wasteful. The Western world is so wasteful. But like, because it was officially out of date, even though it wasn't, throw all this away and we'd eat it. This is my friend Kevin. He made this sandwich with garbage. <laughs> Those are homemade french fries. Wardrobe change, by the way. Kind of cold out here. Anyway, so, and back to 
free time. Again, I, I miss this. I miss not having distractions. Uh, and I can do a whole video on all that. But like, you were hanging out outside um, on picnic tables with lanterns or by headlamp, just playing games, playing on instruments you've made, <laughs> like, or you know, if you bring along. Remember, when you live in this life, you can't have much. You can't, you don't have much. You have to fit all your, everything into a small space. So for every book you bring, you can't bring something else. For every instrument, every, uh, all your gear, you have to literally, everything is an equation. Like how much space is this gonna take up? How much do I really want this, you know? And so you tend to have like very small games with you, very small instruments. If you bring a guitar, well, then that's like, um, that's gonna take up space that like you know you have to have food you have like the, you, it's such a small space again vans are much bigger than my truck so this life is really it's really rewarding in that you have like again now not now because you know if you have a, a internet access you can just scroll 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 but a lot of times you're in places where you don't have internet access so you play games you like i remember sitting around a campfire with some of our friends in joshua tree there is no internet or cell phone and we literally just played like we we're so bored we we're like okay somebody like we all like started eating hot peppers to see who would um who could eat the most insanely hot peppers you know what i mean and we were all drooling and it was fun it was a good memory but i'm just saying like um this isn't the kind of life that a lot of people enjoy i it was a very creative time in my life i really think i built a lot of my creativity because i wasn't consuming things i was just entertaining myself and other people telling stories uh, just like doing all kinds of things just to have fun but um but part of that involves community and we were in community because we were all working together but when i tried to move back into my van my truck and travel around the u.s without having the job and the people in the job that I was gonna run into a lot, it was seriously one of the loneliest times of my life. And so I wanna make that point very clear, like community and not having friends and not having a sense of community that's consistent is the hardest part of van life. And I tried to go back and live in the living in my car life without the community that was, uh, that it was, that came with that lifestyle because of the jobs I was doing and it was, it was a nightmare. I hated it. I hated it. I couldn't wait to get, I, I, I hated it y'all because entertaining yourself with a group of people is way easier than entertaining yourself alone. And especially if you're a woman and you alone, you also like can't, you're limited because you don't, you know, I'm way more afraid of a man walking up to me than a bear. I've written a whole article on that. I want to, I'm going to actually cover that again soon. I also want to show this photo because this was when we were working. So we were on the job. But I, I, I wanna show this to just illustrate that animals are a big problem. I don't mean like predators, I mean like raccoons. This, like, if you leave anything outside, raccoons are gonna get it. We had to put these like 10 to 15 pound water jugs on top of every single cooler, on top of everything. We had to build a fortress around it. And still, this is my friend, um, he was in charge of guarding the, the kitchen that night. And he still had like, you know, paddles from the canoes, you know, scaring them off all night. He didn't sleep at all that night. So like, <laughs> you know, the, the when you live van life, you don't want to do that in a city, right? Um, if you're choosing to do this, not if, I mean, obviously lots of people live in their cars in the city because of the housing crisis and just pff, capitalism. But people who think they're going to go and live in nature in their van, I'm telling you, it is not like, even if you're like, oh, I want to unload the cooler out of my van to make space today. Um, you better wrap. I mean, literally the raccoons have fingers. I can't tell you how many times they literally like they, they can pry things open. They, they are so smart. I made a whole fort way bigger than this. I wish I had a photo of it, of all these cools we tied them together with these climbing gear and put heavy things. They still, they still, are still found a way in. Like you, uh, you are, you are a guest in this environment, right? And no matter what, oh, he's having like deep thoughts. You are a guest there and uh, this is their terrain. So they're like, hey, you brought us food, cool. Thank you. And then you're like, wait, no. I found this list online of like the navigate navigation. So here's the website if you want to look at it. Navigation for van life reality. So number one, parking is harder than you think. 
So they're making fun of this hashtag, home is where you park it. They talk about how even in the middle of Alaska, the state with the largest land mass and smallest population, we had an absurd amount of difficulty finding free, legal, and private parking places. They talk about how they're getting called on the cops. They're talking about Manhattan. Anyway, um, you know, a lot of places have poverty, and with poverty comes a lot of um, crime and danger, especially for women, right? I can't tell you how many sketchy, okay, I'm thinking. I can't tell you how many times I was in such a sketchy, sketchy situation. We'd even try to sleep at truck stops, and then I was like, this is dangerous. All these men are like, probably looking to cheat on their wives and like, whatever, I, that stopped quickly. And then I started sleeping in Walmart parking lots, and even that was scary. And like they said, uh, you know, you can always fall back on Walmart because they allow free, you can sleep in Walmart parking lots. Um, first of all, that's not true in all Walmarts. When I tried to sleep in one in Santa Fe, they had actually uh, made it illegal there because someone, some, some RV dumped their entire um, toilet all over their parking lot and they were like, we're done. Um, I just slept, there was just like very shady people in Walmart parking lot. A lot of homeless men and a lot of times, um, not always, but a lot of time men are homeless. Um, because of addictions, because of mental illnesses, um, and all kinds of tragic things. But that doesn't mean that my empathy does not mean that I want to surround myself with men who I've had more times than one prey on me because they see that I'm in a car or a truck by myself sleeping. And because the United States is such an, a police state, well, first of all, I'm a white woman, so I'm less likely to be harassed by the police than probably anyone. I mean, we know white women in our history with the police, right? So I know that, you know, some of my guy friends who lived in their trucks uh, who are white, they got harassed more than I did because I could always play the like, I'm in danger card. And they'd be like, all right, but you really shouldn't be parking here. But in general, the police don't want people parking anywhere. They basically are outlawing homelessness, which is crazy because there's a housing crisis and all that stuff, but they're outlawing like living in your cars, living in anything, being in public and what I found was like, I remember going to like, I think it was Idlewild or whatever in California. And usually you can sleep in the, just so you know, you can sleep for two weeks. Uh, some of this may have changed, okay? Correct me if I'm wrong. You can usually sleep for two weeks in national forest areas, but as long as it's not like private, like it's someone's not next to someone's house. But like on logging roads, you can sleep there on uh, with no permit for two weeks in the same place so what a lot of people do is they just keep moving and moving and moving to a new place um here's the problem a as a woman i can't tell you how scary it is to be on a logging road trying to camp trying to sleep and then a car comes up you're like oh my god oh my god oh my god because like no witnesses you're like you're <laughs> like seriously i've run into bears plenty in my life by myself never as scared as like a person approaching and me realizing it's a man and I'm in the woods. Second of all, like when I went to Idlewild, I couldn't find anywhere, it wasn't like logging roads because a lot of these places, um, these they're privatized, um, they have camping places. You know how much it costs to camp at some of these places? Like California, it's very expensive to camp. They have like privatized everything. It's like 25 bucks a night to sleep in your car. Like if you get a campsite, but even if you're not gonna use the campsite, the, the table, the, any of that you still have to pay i remember just like i didn't have 25 bucks and being stuck in auto wide so i pulled in at like 2 a.m slept in a site and then woke up at 6 a.m to get out of there before they um because there was all these free spaces anyway like it is so stressful finding a place to sleep overnight and, and then you add being a woman on top of that um and the safety factor like I don't want to be caught, so I want to be remote, but being remote puts me in danger because if I'm remote and no, like if I don't have witnesses, I'm in so much more danger, right? It's just, ugh. So because of the US being obsessed with privatization and over-policing, and again, I can't imagine living in a truck as a black woman. I probably would have been harassed constantly and even put in danger because of police and literally everybody. Do you know what I mean? Like even like doing van life, is a, is, is a privilege. Even just living that lifestyle is in and of itself. If it's a choice, it's a privilege because you are going to be at the mercy of cops constantly because of parking. And people are gonna call the cops on you because if they call the cops on me, I know they're gonna call the cops on someone who does not look like me. So that's why I said in the very beginning, um, it is unless you have money to pay to camp out at places like this or know the ropes 
around how to find this, you are not having this view. So not only are you not gonna have a nice view when you're camping in your van or whatever, uh, van life in general is just hard. So first of all, you always, I mean, so I know some people are doing it, so some people have like good jobs and are doing this. They're like, oh my God, I saved hundreds of thousands of, whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. A lot of people are just like trying to find remote work you know, trying to figure out how to pay bills. And even though their expenses might be down some, a lot of the expenses are actually not that less, much less. You're also gonna have a full-time job of looking for water, parking, dump stations, which again, <laughs> oh, I shouldn't even tell y'all, like I didn't even have like a toilet because I didn't live in a van. So I was literally like shitting in the wood or, you know, like like the, the bathroom alone. is so stressful, y'all. Bathroom, it, like, I, and because everything is in your truck or your van you have to be really careful about where you park it you're always worried about it to make everything secured you know you don't want to just park anywhere because if someone breaks in they steal all your stuff and this goes back to the boring part but you like again some people will be able to like stream tv shows and stuff now in the in in, in france by the way I have 100 gigs of data on my phone every month and I pay 20 bucks a month and I have unlimited call texts and all that crap. But in the US where everything is stupidly expensive, um, I believe I was paying 125 bucks a month for Verizon for six gigs, six. So you are not, you can't afford to just stream as much stuff on your phone or on your computer with the personal hotspot unless you're paying an enormous amount of money for, maybe it's cheaper now, but I just couldn't believe that. 125 bucks a month for six gigs of data. So I had to be very careful about data on my phone. Whereas, you know, in other countries, Spain, France, all over the EU, you get tons of gigs. I swear to God, everything in the US is just like fucking so they're talking about how they're like, oh, we try to do yoga and like with all this downtime, books. We spend a lot of time twirling our thumbs. <laughs> and that brings me to my other point, like exercise. Exercise is really important to me. So um, running is all I could do. You know what I mean? Like maybe I go on hikes, but like you're in like the whole van life thing and like where you run. I mean, I remember like a lot of times being like, oh, right, there's like mountain lines all over here. Like, okay, like it's, there's just all these things you have to think about, right? But I was, luckily I would run every day and that was my exercise. But like, I also had really bad knees. So then some days I couldn't run and I was going crazy. And then also you don't know where you are. Again, phones changes everything. Everything I'm saying is like pfft, a little bit different because of <laughs> smartphones. But let's talk about showering. So I, when I lived in my truck, in like, for instance, when I was living in my truck in, in New Mexico in Taos, when I was a raft guy, I joined the gym. And so that's like, I don't know, it was like 40 or 50 bucks a month. And that way I could shower and I could exercise and I could go to their pool and I could, you know, when I'm sick, go to this hot steam room or whatever. So that was my solution to like showering and exercise. But you have to work around their hours, right? The worst part of, of like that truck life was when you're sick. Oh my God. I just remember being like, I was in Joshua Tree, I was sick as a dog, I was like violently ill. And I'm just like, I don't want to lay down in my truck in the middle of the day where it's super hot and I feel claustrophobic, but it's really windy out, it's really sunny out, there's the elements, there's like, I just wanted to be like safe and, and sick. Being sick when you live like this is so off. Being sick in general sucks. So imagine being stuck in a very confined space and sick. Also like, you don't have a doctor, you don't have a general practitioner because you're on the road, right? So you don't have anybody who knows your stuff. You're gonna pay way more because you're just gonna like have to figure out where to go. Um, just getting sick, going to the doctor, any injuries, if you get injured while you're on the road, forget about it, your whole van life is over. What are you gonna do? Like, let's say you break your leg. You can't live in your van if you get injured. So where do you go back to? Did you give everything away? Do you have anywhere to go back to? Like, you know, just like that, something could happen and all of it's done. Because to be in van life, you have to be very adaptable. You have to be very mobile. You have to have emergency money. And also, if you don't have community because you're moving around all the time, who is going to help you if you get sick, you know? You have to take care of yourself entirely, which, you know, most women are used to knowing how to do anyway. But taking care of yourself entirely when you also have to worry about your safety, um, going to the bathroom. I imagine I had like... I had Giardia and I was living in my truck and I was staying in Joshua Tree and having to get up every time I got sick where I had, you know, it's coming out both ends, right? To get up, put on my headlamp, put on my down jacket, army crawl out of my truck, carry myself, walk across in the dark across the desert to the toilet to do my business multiple times in the middle of the night 
and then get up. I mean, I literally kept like a puke bucket outside of my truck so that I could just, at one point I just slept in the front seat because it was too much effort to crawl into the back. I just slept in, <laughs> sitting up in the front seat with a puke bucket outside my door so that every time I got sick, I could open it and just go bleh, you know what I mean? It was awful. And I spent a lot of time sick while I was living in my truck. It builds character, I guess, whatever. But when you don't have community, you don't have a sense of home, you're just rootless. Again, that stuff is really fun when you're on an adventure, but it is not sustainable for the long run. It is really tiring. Unless you have to live that way, I don't suggest it. Because if anything happens to you and you don't have community, which it's hard to do when you are live on wheels and everyone around you lives on wheels, if there's anyone around you doing this too, which oftentimes there's not. Can't tell you how many times I was like, I just wish other people living in their car would be around, but I wasn't, I was alone. It is just, it is miserable. And so you lack that de desperate need for community. I feel, I feel cut off from myself when I don't have community. I feel c cut off from myself when I don't have, especially women in my life who ground me. And when I was living in my truck, wandering around and didn't have those jobs that created the community itself where we are all moving around together, it was so lonely, y'all. Now, if I had a lot of money and I was doing that, I'd just get hotel rooms until I got better, but I couldn't afford it. And back to the thing with the camping thing, you know, I'm sure it's even more expensive now. This was like 15, 20 years ago. It was like 15, 25 bucks a night to sleep in my car. I, think I might as well be paying rent at that point because there's the price of where you're paying to sleep somewhere. There's the price of gas, car insurance, wear and tear on your car. And when you live in your car and you're driving it all the time and live in your car, you're, it's eventually going to break down. So another point they made here is that van life is more expensive than you think. Because again, people are like, oh, but I'm not paying monthly rent or mortgage and all that stuff. And they talk about um, they have a van payment because these vans are expensive, a gym membership for, you know, showering and stuff. Although if you're moving around, then even that is not, you're not going to get a membership. You're going to pay for a day pass, which is expensive. And then there's the maintenance and the repair part. And you're not bringing in a lot of money steady paycheck and then you have to pay for these like random things that happen to your van and you don't know the mechanic and if you're a woman do you know how much you're going to pay to get your van fixed because you don't know this mechanic and they literally will charge us like twice as much as they will a man for like anything they do my engine literally blew up because i had to trust a mechanic that wasn't my own that i didn't know to fix my radiator and he did a bad job and so the radiator caused a turn like it, it anyway i had to buy a whole new engine it's like four thousand dollars so i had to take a loan to, you know what i mean like I, i'm telling you when you don't have community because you are not in one place it's not amazing things can happen i love traveling i love I have so i have way more good stories from traveling and living like this than bad but the problem is money if you are not financially prepared to handle stuff like this that is more expensive because you don't know people and relying on people to help you sometimes you pay a big price for that and then there's this factor you know i told you about raccoons um, sometimes mice will get into your van. I had a mouse in my truck when I was in Joshua Tree. Every morning I'd wake up and hit this mouse had eaten the same apple. Just kept, I, I really appreciate that thoughtfulness, honestly. Could have taken a bite out of all the apples and ruined them all. But every day just kept eating the same apple. Um, also shredded all my tampons, shredded them up. Apparently that's where they're making a nest. Do you know how hard it is to get a mouse out of your van or your truck? I literally, we call it like puke the truck. I had to literally at some point when I finally was in a place where I could take everything out of it, clean it, but they, they hide in the engine. So I could not get rid of this mouse. The only way to get that I know of to get rid of it, it I mean, I guess traps. I don't even know if those are going to work was to literally just move out of it for a while. Where are you gonna put all that stuff? I literally couldn't get rid of this mouse till I was in a place long enough where I could put all my stuff somewhere else for several days so that it was like, oh, okay, there's no more food here. There's no resources, I guess I'll move. And even then, I mean, anyway, I don't even, God, it was, I was, it was, like, it was like being at war. And if you have a lot of um, abuse in your background, especially in your home, and there is a predator in your home, it's a mouse, but still, and you have something that's in your home that's invading your space that you can't get rid of and your space is tiny, and you're afraid it's gonna like run across your face while you're sleeping. Do you, have, do you, have, do you know how triggering that is? I've told you I literally, um, having bed bugs when I was in New York triggered all my trauma from childhood essay. 
Just saying. Home is a very touchy place. So back to that original thing where your life becomes messy in every sense. So imagine living in a confined space like this and having ADHD. Well, I spent more time looking for things than literally anything else. I probably spent at least two hours a day trying to find something. And luckily my friend Liz helped me figure out a, a better play, way to or, have organize my chaos. You know, so at least I knew like, this is the Tupperware container that has like things, right? But still, because especially, well, when you live in a truck, you have to pull out things to get to the things in the back. So like, that's even different, but like even in a van, you know, everything is behind something and so you have to figure out like, what do I need all the time? And then if you need something, you have to pull, oh God, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Like this is just this person's stuff. They look pretty organized, but you know, again, you're going to have like piles of things. And then also, you know, you're going to have to like tie everything in. You see this like bungee cord there type thing because you also have to pack everything knowing that if you go over a bump everything's gonna explode <laughs> it's just it's a lot so anytime you move your car and you live in or live move your van and you live in your van to make everything and make sure everything's tied down it's just it's so much it's so much thought it's so much it's it's a lot of like mental load um even though it seems simple it's really not and back to being expensive it is actually very expensive to eat well, right? Because you have to, like cooking anything is a pain in the butt. Um, refrigerating things is a pain in the butt, especially if you have a cooler instead of a refrigerator. I don't know, I guess some of these bands probably have refrigerators. I had a cooler. So everything I was having to gauge on like the ice melting and then when the ice melts, then it gets everything wet. So you literally, like I am like a, a master at packing coolers and like what can get wet and what can't and ice how fast ice melts and then the temperature and then you always have to cover the cooler because if it's in the sun with the you know even when you park you know when i parked in walmart i have to be like okay there's one tree in this parking lot and i'm pretty sure okay that's east so the sun's going to come up here so that's going to and so i'd have to strategize where i park during the day so that my stuff my computers my uh my my electronics my food is not in the sun right and so then I had to get curtains and that helped a little bit, but like everything is just, you have to think about everything. But no one tells you this before you move into your van. And that's fine, this is all part of the adventure. But I'm just saying like, if you're not in a really good mental place, this may make it all worse. So just please know that. Because one of the things you're also gonna deal with is that life is going on around you. You're gonna miss the fact that you're not available for these things. You know, everybody else is going to concerts, doing this stuff, they're doing all this social stuff, and you are in your own little world. And that's fine, that's what you wanted, but you are gonna miss it. You're absolutely gonna hate this some days, and if you start hating it more days than loving it, then it's time to stop. And if you're with a partner, Again, this is literally a setup for a nightmare. Please don't do this unless you are in a very solid relationship because we know how men's moods, they weaponize their moods. They weaponize everything. Can you imagine being confined in a space this small with a man who's in a bad mood? Men take up all, not just men. I know women can do this too, but men are terrifying and you know, tend to unalive us and control us with their big bodies and their propensity for violence. So imagine being tra trapped in a small space with a moody man. I can't imagine a bigger hell. It's already hard enough doing this by myself. I can't imagine being in a van with a man. Maybe my husband, because we did confinement together and we did really well. But still, n no one's supposed to live in this, like, this is just not healthy. I need a lot of alone time. I've always needed a lot of alone time. Uh, I just, God, and finally, because I could, I could literally, I could write a book on this, actually, probably will one day, and once I start my Patreon or Substack or whatever it is I'm going to do, it's coming soon, I promise, once I start that, I'm going to share more personal stories, um, because I don't like sharing everything with everyone, so uh, I'll go deeper into this thing if y'all want it, but um, mental health, not only, I mean, you can do telehealth, you can call, like, you can do things online and stuff, but filling prescriptions, I'm narcoleptic, so, um, and ADHD. But narcolepsy is I really, especially when I lived in a car, I definitely needed my um, Ritalin so that I don't fall asleep. I've literally fallen asleep swimming, y'all. Not, not kidding. Filling a controlled substance 
on the road was probably one of the, the, the one of the hardest parts about it. It was so hard to get my prescription because it's out of state. My doctor's in Tennessee. Like every single pharmacy gave me so much crap every month when I had to fill this prescription. I was like, please, please, please. I had, sometimes I go to like five different. Far it was so stressful. So if you have a controlled substance because you're ADHD or narcoleptic or something else, or just have a prescription in general, sometimes it is so stupidly hard because people like don't people don't like that you don't have an address. You know, try getting a driver's license when you live in your van. Like no no like the the the, the government and people like they don't know what to do with people who don't have an address. So all this bureaucratic stuff is like ten times harder too. Where are you going to get your mail? That's another thing. Where are you going to get your mail? General delivery at the post office is your best bet. Even that, like, it's it's if important mail. Like, who are you going to send it to? Got to be very careful. Who, who's address? Don't sit. Don't have it go to a man's house, please. Have it to a fr a girlfriend, uh, like a you know a friend or a parents or sister or something. Do not ever send your mail to a man's house because that man is going like. You're gonna miss really important stuff. You don't want him having any man having access to all that stuff unless you're like maybe married. Anyway, I mean, I'm making gross generalizations here. So again, I'm not saying don't do the van life. I really loved my adventures when I was in my 20s. But what I hate is like seeing people who are like even in their 30s and stuff are like, I want to move to my van. If you have um, financial security or looking for adventure and all that stuff. Try it, do it. Hey, I, I, if someone loves van life, I love that for them. But what I hate, and I've been hating it since, you know, they started doing it on Instagram, is like people making these accounts of like this amazing van life. And it's all bull. And it's also like, it, it's, there's like, there's a lot of like Nepo babies are living in vans and then selling this lifestyle. And it's just not realistic for people who don't have a lot of money. So if you're gonna live the van life, make sure you have money. Make sure you have money and savings. Make sure you are prepared for huge financial hits that you were not prepared for. Be prepared to be lonely. Be prepared to have to get really comfortable talking to people and making friends and connecting with total strangers and you know, whatever. Just just, just know what you're getting into. Um, again, a lot of people do not have the privilege of even doing this because of, because of money, because of racism, because of, patriarchy right again like i i was okay doing this and i do believe it's way more dangerous dating and living with a man than it will ever be to live in your van <laughs> so don't not do it because you know you watched law and order svu too many times um the stranger danger is never going to be as dangerous as dating a man i will die on that hill so i don't want to scare you into not doing adventures like this just be aware that as a woman, it's gonna cost you a lot more than it's gonna cost a man. You have to do a lot to take care of yourself and make sure that you do not die uh, or get you know endangered. And um, do it for yourself. Don't ever do this for a dude. Do not let a dude talk you into moving into a van with him, please, please. It usually doesn't end well. It's ended well, okay, for some people I know, but it's usually a nightmare. Always have a, always have a backup plan. Always have access to some sort of money or income to get you out of that situation. Um, and, and just know that you're going to have to work really hard at community, um, and how to stay connected to people because that's probably the biggest challenge of it all. Let me know if you want more content like this, cause this is kind of random, but I know this is my world. I lived in this for a while, even though it's changed and it's much different. I still like know the reality of a lot of it. And if you like this video, please share, comment, like all those things. It really, 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 really helps me grow my page so that I can afford to keep doing stuff like this instead of having to go get another job. <laughs> I love doing this and I want to keep doing it. So thank you for your support, for being here. And let me know what you think of this video.